All right, uh, so those of you who don't know me, my name's Jason. I'm the Point Kids pastor here, and today I get to be in the big church with, with the big kids. It's good to be here with you today. And um, I'm going to continue with the uh, Faith Over Fear series. And I was thinking about an experience uh, I had this summer with my family. Uh, my family goes to a thing called Family Camp. We got any campers in here? No campers? No? Anybody? A couple. A couple. <laughs> Not many. No love for the camping. All right. Well, we like it. We like to go camping. It's up at Camp Kern. Our family goes and we hang out for the weekend, and, uh, and they have all kinds of outdoor activities, and one of the things they have is a zip line, a zip line. And so, this is hard to see in this picture, but that's actually like 50 feet tall, maybe three stories tall. And so, for several years now, we've been going, and my oldest, I have four kids, my oldest, Indy, she was brave enough to do it the first time. She freaked out, but she went through and did it, but my middle two kids, Phoenix and Ivy, have struggled to actually do the zip line. And so, so what happens, if it's, it's a little blurry. I was like really far away there, but you have to climb up this big thing. And it's like, it's camp, so there's like ropes, courses and stuff. It's really, really awkward. You have to climb up, it's like a maze of climbing. You climb all the way up this 50 foot thing. And you get to the top, and what, what always happens is the kids are really excited. I want to do the zip line. I'm going to do it. And then they get there. We climb up, and I go with them, and we climb up. And what happens is you're, you're, real, in, you're real enclosed, and then you, you get to the top. And you walk out on the ledge, and it hits them. The, the reality of how high they are hits them. And you're just looking down, <laughs> and you see it. You see the fear overtake them. And they were really excited, and now they're like a zombie. <laughs> and their eyes glaze over, and they can't really talk. I, they can't really move because they're afraid. <laughs> they're high up. And so eventually what happens is they, they get out the words, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I'm, like, I'm trying to encourage them to do it, and they're like, I can, I can clearly see not happening. So what happens is you have to climb all the way down and it really stinks because sometimes there's like a line of people waiting. So it's like the walk of shame. Everybody's, everybody's watching you. It's the worst for kids. So this has happened for several years in a row where we, where we go, they're excited to do it. And, it, and it's hard because it's not, it, it's kind of for youth, it's small and I can't fit uh, one time Pastor Jeff did it, and uh, his, his overcoming of fear was just climbing up there. It wasn't so much the zip line, it was that he fit through the thing. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so we kept going, they kept going to the top, and the fear would hit them, and they would go back down year after year. And then this year, we went, and I didn't even think we'd do the zip line. They're like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through all that and the walk of shame and getting scared and all that. I'm like, okay, we don't have to do it. So we're at camp, and then suddenly uh, they want to do the zip line. I'm like, I thought we weren't doing this again. I don't want to climb all the way up there. And, and so they said, we want to do it. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And we, we climb up, and we get to the top, and I see them, the, the same thing, fear hits them in the face, but this time they're walking through it. <laughs> they walk through it, and as you can see there, the hard part is the, the top guy's on the ledge you walk out on, but then you have to climb down to a little thing, like two by two little square, and you have to climb down, and they can't really reach the thing, and they're like trying to get down there, and they get down there, and there's no way to do it. You can't lean back, you can't sit down, you have to just jump. It's the only way to get off. Uh, so sure, sure enough, they, we get up there. They're, they're scary, but they're walking through it. And they just get up there and one, two, three, we do it. They do it. Phoenix does it. He goes down the zip line, and we're all freaking out. And it was a proud parent moment. <laughs> My son overcoming his fear. <laughs> a character building day for him. And uh, it was really a big deal because, because I've been through it with them for years of them just getting overwhelmed with fear and, 
parents, you've seen this with your kids when that happens. You're like, come on, you can do this. You can do this. You're encouraging them. You can overcome this. And he did it. He finally did it. And he gets down and he's so excited, he immediately runs back up and does it again. <laughs> and he's doing like Superman stuff and hamming it up. And his sister Ivy's like, I want, I want to do it now. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Same thing. We get up there, the fear hits her, and she, she, she does it. She climbs down, and sure enough, she jumps and does it. Now, Ivy was a little different. Uh, she just did it like this <laughs> the whole time. And um, when she was done, again, we're all, like, cheering for her, like, yeah, Ivy, you did it. This is awesome. You overcame your fear. And um, we're like, you want to go up and do it again? She's like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> never doing that again in my life. <laughs> but she did it. You don't have to like it, but she did it. She overcame her fear. And I was thinking about it. I was thinking, what, what changed? What changed this year uh, from the years past? And uh, I remembered that right before we went to the zip line, we had went to this other outdoor activity. It's called the Giant Swing. And they had these two huge telephone poles and in between they have a swing and they take a rope and pull you back up into the treetops and let you go and it's a giant swing and so some of us had done it and then we were we were about to leave and I hear I want to do it I want to do the giant swing and I look over and it's my youngest Isla she's only four years old it's like that big and um, I'm like I, I don't even know if you're tall enough to do this and so I go to the guy, and I'm like, she, she, she wants to do the giant swing. He's, and he's like, well, uh, we do have, if we put her in this special harness, she can do it. Sure enough, she gets up there, and she does the giant swing. And uh, we, have, we have a picture there of Viola uh, doing the giant swing. There she is. <laughs> there is Viola. And this was another thing. They were all scared of this giant swing, right? They, did, they didn't want to do it, and Isla, out of nowhere, comes up and just says, I want to do the giant swing. And what I realized was the courage of my youngest influenced the courage of my older kids. Courage has influence. Same way fear does, the same way fear does. I saw the fear on the, on the zip line. People get up there and get scared and go back down and it would spread. If other kids were scared, they would, they would get scared. They say, well, he didn't. He didn't have to do it. Maybe I can get out of it. Maybe it is that scary. But what happened was my youngest had the courage to step up and do the giant swing, and it put, it put a pressure on the other ones. It, it put a pressure on them. And it also inspired them. And that's what changed. All of a sudden, they're like, all right, she can do it. I can do it. <laughs> We're not going to be left out. But the, my point is, fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. It spreads. But so is courage. So is faith. It's contagious. All right? And so, so today, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 34. And um, I've been meditating on this psalm uh, since our, our last series, uh, Hope for the Brokenhearted. The, the main verse there was, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He delivers those who are discouraged. And... Um, I started studying this psalm, and the whole psalm is just incredible. Uh, it's full of uh, really powerful stuff, and it's actually, Psalm 34 is an acrostic poem in the Hebrew alphabet, so this was used for teaching. So each, each uh, part of the poem is, starts with a letter in the alphabet. It was used for teaching. And, and also one of the reasons it's my favorite psalm is the title of the psalm which is written by David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech causing him to send him away. Uh, it's a very inspiring uh, title there, uh, David being insane. And so you might say, David, what is this? David being insane. And um, if you look at the story, it's actually found in 1 Samuel. And uh, this is the story of when David was on the run from King Saul. And King Saul was trying to kill him. And uh, King Saul is one of the most tragic figures in all the Bible. And uh, 
his story is so sad. Saul is full of fear. His fear leads to insecurity. His insecurity leads him to seek approval from the people, acceptance from the people, which leads to disobedience, which leads him opened up to torment. There's a pattern there. Uh, Fear, insecurity, seeking approval of the people, disobedience, (laughs) opened up to Torah. So Saul is full of anxiety, depression, frustration, jealousy, and fits of rage. Some of that should sound a little familiar to our culture. Um, And the root of all of it is fear. At the root of this whole thing is fear. And he's he's, he's really insecure. And so David comes on the scene. At first, David is actually there to comfort him. He's playing the harp and trying to relieve this torment from him. David gets sucked into the whole David and Goliath thing, defeats Goliath, and David becomes super popular. They're singing songs about him. Everybody's into David. And now Saul fears David. So he, after that, he's trying to kill David. And David is on the run uh, from King Saul. And David at first responds with fear to this threat from Saul. And there's three instances right in a row where David is just responding with fear to this threat of Saul. He almost gets his best friend Jonathan killed. A bunch of innocent people end up getting killed. He's on the run. And finally, he ends up running, and he tries to find refuge with the Philistines. He's he's with Israel's arch enemies. And he actually goes in there carrying Goliath's sword. It's crazy. And when he gets in there, People start to recognize who he is. They say, aren't you that guy that they sing songs about? And so he's trying to act like he's not David. David's trying to act like he's not David. So he starts to act insane. He tr- totally debases himself. He drools. He scratches on the wall. And the king's like, we got enough crazy people with the Philistines. Get out of here. They kick him out. <laughs> that's, that's what the title is. That's what the title's talking about. Um, So David escapes from there to a place called the Cave of Adullam. The Cave of Adullam. And they believe this is where the Psalm 34 was written. And in 1 Samuel 22 and 2, it says, All those who were in trouble or owed someone money or were discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. He had about 400 men with him. So this is a major turning point in David's life, these, this group of people, this discontented people, and actually eventually the entire nation of Israel, this is the turning point. And it's fast. I really encourage you to read Psalm 34 and read through 1 Samuel. It really hits different when you read, read them in context. And so this fundamental shift in David, remember, he was in fear. All of his actions before this, those three... Uh, three instances have been a total disaster. Total disaster. His friend's almost dead. Innocent people are getting killed, and then he's almost getting killed. He's seeking refuge with his enemies. He's off. David is off. He's reacting in fear, all right? And this is the, this is the shift. When he gets here, he shifts. And this is one of those stories where David, this is where David became David, <laughs> There are several moments in his life where you're like, this guy's different. This is one of them, where the shift happens. And he's actually teaching these men about serving God. He's teaching these discontented outcasts. It's really a group of outcasts. He's teaching them about God. And it's amazing because what's happening here, this is, a, this is in a cave. He's on the run. But this is actually ground zero for the future kingdom of Israel. There'll be, there'll be a fundamental shift in the entire nation because of the shift right here with David. And so, um, I want to look at three points where David is talking to these men about, about faith over fear. And they're all in Psalm 34 here. 
And the first one is, I will boast in the Lord. Let the oppressed hear and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Let's praise his name together. And this word boasting, um, it's, a little, it's a little different in a modern context. And boasting in ancient times was something when people were about to go into battle, they would boast about their king. They would boast about their God. It's what they would use to pump themselves up for courage, but it wouldn't be necessarily about themselves. It would be about their king. And this is, this is really important, important in this shift because up until that point, the situation is God wanted to be the king of Israel, but Israel wanted to have their own king. And you see this insecurity play out on a national scale. A nation that is insecure. <laughs> a nation that's insecure. Okay? And so they, they, and they say, they reject God. They say, no, we don't want you as a king. We want a real king so we can be like the other nations. This, this happens over and over and over. This is like the, the history of Israel. And God tells the prophet Samuel, he says, they've been doing this since I brought them out of Egypt. Over and over again, they reject me. They get, in, they get insecure, and they get influenced by uh, the other cultures around them. They want a king. So, so God tells them, if you do this, it's going to be terrible. If you get a king, it's going to be awful. And they won't stop. They keep pushing it. We want a king. And so God says, okay, you can have a king. And I, I think there's, there's really something there because a lot of times judgment it's just judgment from God. It's just God gives you what you want. It is. It's, it, it says it. God turns people over to their sins. They keep doing it. They keep pushing it. They keep going this way. Eventually, he says, okay, there you go. There you go. The judgment is already, it's just baked in the cake. It's already there. Is that all right, you want it? You got it. So they pushed it. The insecure nation pushes it. We want a king. We want to boast in a king. We can see. And so they get Saul. So now they have an insecure king. And Saul, Saul keeps, every time he disobeys God, it always has to do with people. He's afraid the people are going to abandon him. He's afraid the people, when they're there, aren't going to approve of him. They influence him. Every time, he's, it has to do with him being insecure and being influenced by people. And so, eventually, eventually, God's hand lifts off of him. And so, this is the shift from boasting in, in people and a king to, to David saying, what's he say there? I will boast in the Lord. I will boast in the Lord. It's a shift from faith in people to faith in God. A shift from faith in people to faith in God. Now, David is going to be their future king. This, this is a huge change where he's turning the focus off of people to God. In Galatians 6.14, Paul says, But may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Uh, Paul uses this word boast a lot. He's talking about boasting, boasting in the cross. And basically he's saying, the world has nothing on me. The world has nothing on me. I'm boasting in the cross. He's boasting that whatever the world is throwing at me, I... <laughs> I, I am, my, my identity is secure in Christ in the cross. We'll look at the next one here. Uh, Psalm 34 and 5. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Look for God's illuminating presence in your life. The more Saul looked at his troubles, he was obsessively looking at his troubles. The worse they got. He got into self-pity, catastrophizing. Does our out, is our attitude helping us get through our situation, or is it making it worse? Does your attitude, is it, is it helpful? Is it going to get you through your situation, your attitude? This, 
And you see echoes throughout the scriptures of uh, Psalm 34. It's referenced all the time. And one of these echoes is in James 1 and 2. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. <laughs> That's such a hardcore uh, verse. And uh, it reminds me of a time we were, I was golfing, and it was, it was me and Bishop and Pastor Jeff and uh, Darren, and we were out there, and Bishop, <laughs> Bishop was <laughs> hitting his shot, and we're all pastors, so this is pastor humor, I guess, but <laughs> he, he takes his shot, and he totally shanks it, and, <laughs> and we're dry, uh, everybody was behind him waiting for him to finish, and we drive by, and as we're driving by, Pastor Jeff goes, count it all joy. We did that to each other the rest of the day. Every time somebody shanked their shot, count it all joy. Now that usually didn't produce joy. They usually were pretty angry about that. Count it all joy. But does it help? Does your attitude help in your golf game when you get mad and freak out? Is that going to help your next shot? <laughs> all right. Let's see here. This last one. Psalm 34, 19 and 20. It's such a powerful verse. This is, what, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. So this idea of your, the, the bones not being broken, it's a fascinating fascinating term there and uh, it's poetic language so so what he's not saying if you break your arm or if you have a broken bone you're not righteous right that's not what he's saying but it gets their subtlety there because this verse actually shows up in the gospel of John and John said talking about Jesus bones were not broken when he was crucified he references this verse and um, and there, it's pointing part of it to the Passover lamb. That's part of the, the reference they're talking about. But there's another way to look at this. And it has to do with your bones being your core. The core of who you are in your bones. In your bones. And the miracle here, the miracle of the, the resurrection, it's that, because you look at it, it's like, so his bones were broken, like, he still died. He still died. He still went through it. What they're trying to, and even in John, what, the, what they're trying to get at is even when, he, when you go through the trial, you go through the thing, whatever it is, your core will not be broken. Your core, your soul, inside, your bones will not be broken. That's what they're talking about there. And it has, and in, in I've, I've been meditating on this. There's a different, there's a different type of, of miracle. There's a different type of miracle. There's the instantaneous miracle. That's usually what we're talk, people are talking about when they say miracles. It's like you pray, instantly, everything changes, boom. All right? There is another type of miracle, another type of faith in the Bible that it talks about a lot, which has to do with endurance. Endurance and resilience. Resilience. We need resilience. Our kids need resilience. It's not just a miracle if you're in a trouble and you're taken out of it to the other side. That's... that's, that's that is, I believe in it. I believe it can happen instantaneously. But I'm telling you, there's another type of miracle. It's the miracle of faith and resilience to go through it. Through it. Not just out of it. Through it. Through it. This is, this is what happens more often than not. And it's not any less miraculous. To go through it. Jesus didn't skip from, from birth to, to the throne. What's up with that? 
Did he skip all of it? <laughs> Did he go through it? Is he our example? Okay, so there's going to be some stuff we got to go through. <laughs> right? Right? Might as well get ready. What does it say there? The righteous person faces many troubles. Now, here's John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble and suffering. But take courage. I have conquered the world. This is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible right there. Right there. And this is at the very tail end of the, the last Passover meal. And the, the party saying, I have told you these things, it's from this long message he has just given his disciples. A lot of it has to do with who he is, then believing that he is God. He is the Son of God. Really believing that. I'm telling you, I am the source of life. He goes over it over and over again. I am the vine. You have to be connected to me. And he keeps telling them they're going to have trouble. And by the end of it, they're saying, we believe. It's one of the interesting times where Jesus, it, people interpret it different ways, but it sounds like he's being sarcastic. After he gives them this message, they're like, yeah, we finally believe. He says, oh, you believe, do you? It be, and it's, I, I think there's a part of it that is sarcastic because then he says, you all are going to be scattered by tomorrow. You all are going to leave me by tomorrow. You, we believe. Do you believe now? And I was thinking about this, this peace. That's a part of peace. There's a rest there. There's a rest there. There's a peace. I think... Uh, Saul's insecurity was devastating. He had no peace in his identity. He had no rest in who he was. There is a peace in knowing who Christ is, and he keeps trying to tell them who he is and who they are in him. There's a peace. There's a rest there. And it's interesting. They're like two opposites, peace and rest. And then he immediately says you're going to have trouble and suffering. Peace and rest, and you're going to have trouble and suffering. That's not a promise we like to cheer about a lot. <laughs> the master gave us. He says it's coming. It's coming. And this is what I'm saying. This is, this is to me, this is so powerful that I've, I'm seeing this because there's a hardiness to it. I'm telling you, there's a different kind of resilience in what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about skipping the problems. He's talking about the strength to go through it. All right? And he says here, but take courage. Now, there's different translations of that. Some say take heart, be of good cheer. I'm not crazy about that one. Um, take courage. I like the courage part. The word actually means, that specific word, it means to dare. To dare. I dare you. <laughs> I dare you guys to believe in me. I dare you to do it. To dare. We're to, because remember, my, my, it's daring. He's saying you're going into the fray. You have to dare to walk. You're following me. Get ready. You have to be daring. There's a part of faith that is, is not trying to just get out of it. It's going into it. It's going straight at it. This boasting, what I'm talking about, they're doing it before they're charging into battle. This is, this is a part of faith. It's an action. It's an action. And I was thinking about this um, uh, situation that happened with Pastor Katrina. Pastor Katrina. And uh, this was a year, a couple years ago. A couple years ago, she had an accident and she fell and she broke or fractured her hip. All right? It was a bad situation. It was really bad. She had to have uh, surgery. They put pins in there. And... Um, it was, a, it was a rough situation for her. And so 
after the surgery and thing, the, uh, the doctor sends her home. My sister had come in town. She was helping take care of her. And she was, I mean, she couldn't walk. She couldn't do anything. She's, she's laid up, right? And um, the first thing the doctor says is you have to rest. You have to rest. You can't be up trying to do stuff. If you keep doing that, you're going to hurt yourself. You have to rest for the healing, all right? What Jesus said, peace. First he said, peace. And then after she rests and begins to heal, a different type of healing has to happen. She's rested. That's important. That's part of it. We need the rest. But he, say, he tells her, now you're going to have to work out. Now you're going to have to work out. But the option was this. Look at this. And this has to do with fear. The option was don't, don't go through the, the training, the workouts, and lose your mobility. Lose your mobility. Or face, okay, so you have that as a fear, or you have go through it, and, it, and you, you can get your mobility back, but it's going to be a painful process. <laughs> those, were, those were your two options. <laughs> those were your two options. Um, and oftentimes, guys, that's just the reality. That's just, it's, it, you go this way, it's not going, you're, you're still going to face pain. You go this way, you're going to face pain. When, when, when God calls us, when he says, you follow me, there's a price to pay there. There's a part of it that, that, that can hurt. And, and um, so it was lose your mobility or, or do these workouts. So I had been going over there and visiting her for a while and um, it, it, she, she was hurting. She was hurting. She was out of, out of sorts and, and not doing too well. And this went on for, for a while. I could tell it was, it was really, really heavy on her. And I'll never forget, there was a day I went over there, and I, I was talking to her, and I saw a shift. I saw something change. And it was this faith. It was faith. Something happened in her. It's the faith I'm talking about. The, f the faith of endurance. The faith of taking on the challenge. The faith of being resilient. It's a different kind of faith. I saw, and it was a decision that she made, and I could hear it in her voice. She started talking different. She started talking, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get through this. I'm going I'm to do the exercises. And it changed. I knew it. I knew it in my soul. As soon as I talked to her, I said, she's going to be all right. I could tell just because of the way she was talking. The way she was talking, she had made her mind up, nope, I'm doing it. I'm going through. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to do it. And um, she had to do all these exercises. And I think she went to the place and scared everybody because she was yelling and hollering, <laughs> trying to do her exercises. <laughs> Faithful stuff. It's, it's real, man. Real. And uh, sometimes that's how it works. You have to, the choice is to go through it. To go through it. But you're not going through it alone. You're not going through it alone. Boast in your king. Boast in your king, the one who is with you. What do you say? I have, I have conquered the world. I have conquered the world. That's an amazing thing that he says there. Because if you look at it, his life up to that point, he has, he, you could say, yeah, he's conquered the world. He's lived a sinless life. He's, he's done his ministry. He's conquered the world. But in another way, he's saying this before the cross. He hasn't even gone to the Garden of Gethsemane yet. He's talking faith talk. He's talking faith talk. If you look at, at, at Psalm 34, he's talking about the Lord has delivered me from all my troubles. He delivered him from some troubles, 
But David was still right in the middle of troubles. Saul was still trying to kill him. There was a fundamental shift in David, and you see it right there, the cave of, the cave of Adullam. It changes in him where he, he, he pivots from fear, from reacting to everything in fear, to faith. Now, that doesn't mean he was magically out of all of his troubles. It's ex the exact opposite. What the faith did was give him the courage and strength to go through those troubles, how he reacted to them. That's what it did for him. I, I love that we're just singing that song. I didn't even think about it. Our bones will sing. Our bones will sing. Your, your bones will not be broken. Your core will not be broken. Whatever you're going through today. Whatever you're going through today. Let's, let's pray right here. Lord, I, 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 you love these people so much. And I know some folks are going through some things. They're right in the middle of it. Lord, I pray that we would begin to pray with expectation. Expectation not just that magically all the troubles go away, but Lord, that you would give us the inner strength, the inner strength and courage to dare to believe that you are with us, that we are never alone. As, as Paul said, no matter what is happening in your life, whatever trouble you are going through, nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. He is with you through every trouble, every trial, every bit of pain, every bit of sadness. He is with you to give you the strength and courage to face the troubles in your life. And Lord, I pray, I pray for a new, a new courage, a new strength. Lord, that they would look to you and boast in you, not looking to things, not looking to people, not looking, not looking to anything but you, Lord, because you are our king and we boast in you. And we look for your your work in our life with expectation, God. And we, and we know you have done it. You have done it, and you are with us through all of our trials and troubles. In Jesus' name, amen.